Thanks, Terry. Thanks uh, very much to all of you for taking time uh, out of your schedule to come out this evening and uh, give me a chance to share with you some of what I've been working on and some of what um, I've been getting excited about from the last little while. Um, uh, just to dive right in, I found it useful to think about the evolution of different fields of human endeavor in terms of their um, in terms of their progression through what I'll call three different decision-making paradigms. I'm not going to suggest that this is a particularly uh, um, a rigorous framework. I haven't really tested it out much. I've just found it helpful in, in structuring my own thinking uh, as I reflect on where we are in, in, in different fields of endeavor. And I think of it this way, that decision-making goes from what I'll call idiosyncratic to probabilistic to deterministic, depending on how well we understand the underlying nature of the cause and effect mechanisms that lead to particular outcomes of interest. So in the very early stages of any particular field, decision-making is largely, as I've suggested here, idiosyncratic. And what that means is that we don't have a particularly accurate or shared understanding of not even what causes what, but indeed even what's correlated with what. And so as a consequence, we all basically make our best guess, and decision-making is essentially a function of following your heart. Right? You can think about the early stages of medicine looking much like that. Um, where it was essentially each individual doctor making their own best guess on what they thought would help you under these circumstances. There were no shared principles for guiding precisely how you would cure a particular ailment. Probabilistic decision making is a little better, right? There we have a, an understanding of sort of what goes with what. We may not get it right all the time, we may not actually have the causal mechanisms all figured out, but we do have a sense of the correlation. And so as a consequence, rather than following our heart, we can at least follow the odds. Right? And there's a lot of medicine that looks like that today, particularly the treatments of various um, sorts of cancers, for example, where we really don't understand what causes what and why, but we have a sense of what kinds of therapies tend to work under what sets of circumstances. Right? So we're following the odds. And then there's deterministic decision making. And in deterministic decision making, we do have a correct and shared understanding of the cause and effect principles at work. So now instead of following the odds, we can actually just follow the rules. Right? And that's a test for strep throat. And we know exactly what sorts of symptoms to look for, we know what tests to administer, we know how to interpret the tests, and we know what to prescribe as a consequence of the results. So follow your heart, follow the odds, follow the rules. And when I think about innovation, my take on it is that innovation sits pretty squarely in the idiosyncratic follow your heart camp. And I think that comes through most clearly when you think about how most organizations attempt to manage innovation, and indeed the state of the art, when it comes to talking about innovation management processes. It's not uncommon for, te for people to talk about the importance uh, of increasing the variation in the ideas that you have. You launch innovation tournaments, you do X prize like sorts of initiatives, uh, you, you throw the, the walls of the, you break down the walls of the organization, try and bring ideas in from outside. The idea is to increase the variation. Then the object of the exercise is to try and subject these ideas to selection pressures as quickly as you can. So the minimum sufficient product, I think that's probably a, a, an increasingly popular term of art. The notion is that if you can expose these ideas to marketplace pressures as quickly as possible, you can reduce the cost of failure because after all, nobody really knows what success looks like in the early days. So the object of the exercise is if you want to find out if the dogs eat the dog food, you have to feed it to them and find out. And then finally, there's the retention, right? You try and hang on to what's working and you try and jettison what's not as early and as quickly as you can. So we manage innovation in this rather random way because we fundamentally don't know what causes what and why, and we don't know what the characteristics of successful innovations are ex ante. Once something has succeeded or failed, of course, we're very good at turning around and coming up with explanations for why that outcome was inevitable. But ex ante, it's a very low odds proposition. So innovation, I would suggest, very much in this idiosyncratic, follow your heart type of, type of space. And what I'd like to suggest is that as a consequence of some of the work that I've been able to, to do in collaboration with uh, Intel Corporation and uh, with a couple of researchers at the Harvard Business School, we're able to make the claim that we're taking a step toward making innovation more of a probabilistic follow the odds proposition rather than this highly intuitive idiosyncratic decision making paradigm. And so what I'd like to do is share with you how that research actually played out. Now, disruption theory, some of you may well be familiar with it, so I'll give you the, the briefest of overviews, is a theory of innovation that was discovered by Clay Christensen and popularized in his 1997 book, The Innovator's Dilemma. And disruption theory prescribes as follows. It says that innovations that begin as a, an inferior solution appealing to a small, relatively unattractive segment of the marketplace 
very often ultimately end up improving in ways that allow them to compete successfully for the mainstream market in ways that incumbents are fundamentally unable to respond. Right? So there are all kinds of examples. I'll give you an iconic case uh, that, that illustrates it, I think, in, in reasonably sharp relief, which is the case of Southwest Airlines. Right? So this is a company that I'm sure you're all sick of hearing of as examples of just about anything. Right? It's held up as a paragon of just about every dimension of great management there is. But among uh, its many other attributes, it is a signal ex uh, example of disruption. Right? Southwest starts out appealing to a, a small, short-haul, point-to-point root structure segment uh, in Texas and in, and in California back in the mid-70s mid and early 80s. It was a piece of the airline market that the incumbent airline carriers weren't especially interested in defending. They had bigger fish to fry. And so as a consequence, Southwest had a very small but profitable niche that effectively all to itself. Now, over time, what happened is that it's enabling technology. It's a, a, a technical term that I introduced in manifesto. It's enabling technology was the ability of the 737, the plane on which Southwest had standardized, to fly ever increasing distances at ever lower cost per revenue passenger kilometer. And as a result of those improvements, Southwest was ultimately able to compete for the entire continental US uh, commercial airline market. And so as a consequence, it became enormously successful. Right? So it starts out appealing to a small, unattractive market builds a business model optimized for those needs, and then that in, uh, an enabling technology allows that very same business model to compete for segments of the market that used to be out of reach. Now, disruption theory makes some fairly stark predictions. It says that sustaining innovations, that is to say innovations that are targeted at the needs of the most demanding and most profitable segments of the market, when introduced by incumbents, will be successful, right? It says that Disruptive innovations, when introduced by an entrant, will in fact be successful. And on the off diagonal, you will see failure, right? The sustaining innovations introduced by an entrant will fail. Disruptive innovations introduced by an incumbent are also predicted to fail. Yeah. This says essentially, if you show up with a better mousetrap and you don't already make mousetraps, I don't like your chances, right? You want to find a way to get into the mousetrap business, you have to find a way to disrupt it. Now, as I mentioned before, it's always easy to explain in retrospect why something turned out the way it did. And indeed, most business books, and I'll tar myself with this brush, uh, are guilty of precisely that approach to science, right? You, you, you kind of come up with a series of examples, you then impose your theory on those examples, and you say, gee, what a coincidence, my theory happens to explain all the examples I chose. How about that? Right? The key test for any theory is, of course, whether or not it actually improves our predictive accuracy. Until you can actually demonstrate some sort of improvement in predictive accuracy, all you have is a compelling hypothesis at best. And so, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, as a result of some work in collaboration with Intel, we were actually able to subject disruption theory to that, to that test. And here's how that played out. Intel Corporation, a company that in this part of the world needs no introduction, has a new businesses group. And inside NBG, there was the new business initiatives group called NBI. And NBI's remit is to uh, evaluate and fund new business ideas that bubble up from within inside Intel. So a group of folks, five, six people, uh, have a great idea for a new product or service that they'd like to launch. They bring it to the NBI uh, um, uh, Capital Appropriations Committee. That's my term, not theirs. Um, and, uh, and then they are either funded or they're not, right? And, and the NBI folks will look at a great many more proposals than they can actually fund, of course. That's just the nature of the way these processes work out. Now, over a period of about 10 years, uh, NBI had funded 48 businesses. And, uh, and there was a fellow inside NBI named Thomas Thurston, who was a patent lawyer, uh, working for one of the groups inside NBI. And he decided that he wanted to look at all of, these, uh, all of these businesses that had been funded through the lens of disruption theory. And so he sat down with the 48 business plans without knowing the outcomes, and this is critical. He didn't know whether or not they had survived. He only knew they had been funded. And he decided to categorize their prospects for future survival based on the predictions of disruption theory. And here's how he categorized that portfolio. He looked at these 48 businesses and he said, I think that 39 of them are attempts to enter a new business with a sustaining innovation. So by the lights of disruption, I think they'll fail. There were six, six innovations where Intel already was, a, was a, a material player, and the innovations were targeted at those mainstream markets. He said, this is an, a sustained innovation by an incumbent. I like its chances. And there were two that were disruptive initiatives in markets where Intel was already an incumbent. So we looked at those and said, they'll fail. Now let's think about this for a minute, because this takes some, puts, 
them, right? This is a portfolio of 48 funded companies. Um, the young Thomas Thurston looks at them here and says, well, of those 48, I think 43 are going to, I think 42 will fail and only six are going to make it. So how do you think he did? Well, if he did particularly poorly, I wouldn't have a book and we wouldn't all be here, right? So, um, if that's a sucker punch. If you missed that one, uh, I don't like your chances. Um, here's how it turned out. Reds are failures, greens are successes. Right? Of the 39 he predicted failure for, 38 of them actually failed. One succeeded. Now, unless that one is Facebook, I don't know how this portfolio <laughs> does overall, right? And then down here, we've got six initiatives that he predicted to succeed, um, of which four did, two failed. And over here, two predicted to fail that actually did fail. What that means is that the portfolio of initiatives that were funded by Intel had a success rate of just over 10%, about five out of 48. Next, right? so they went five and 43 was their record. Thurston's record was four and two, a 66% survival rate. Now, you don't want to get too excited about this, right? Because after all, it's one data point. You can draw any line you want through one data point, right? That's what they taught me in the doctor program at Harvard. <laughs> so you don't, want to get to, you don't want to hang your hat on this one observation. This could very easily be an outlier. This has no statistical significance. It is, as they say in the business, at best suggestive. So we decided we'd like to try and subject this to an actual scientific test. And this is where Intel's collaboration was especially helpful because we were able to take those 48 business plans and write them up as two-page cases, right? So Thomas sat down and translated each of these business plans into two-page disguised business cases. Then we were able to take them to a grant uh, population of about 500 MBA students across three schools. We were at Harvard, MIT, and the Ivy Business School in London, Canada. And at each school, we ran the same experiment. Each MBA student was given a selection, a randomly selected uh, sample of six of these business plans. They were asked to read them and evaluate them based on whatever it was they carried around in their head as a consequence of having gone to a top flight business school for a year. Right. Then we exposed them to disruption theory, sometimes with as little as a one hour lecture. And then we repeated the experiment. We said, here are six different cases to each student. But now, instead of doing it using whatever algorithm you happen to carry around in your head before, we want you to do it this way. Make your predictions using disruption theory. Right? Now, prior to learning about disruption theory, this was the track record of the population of MBA students in picking the successes and failures, right? The overall portfolio that Intel had in fact you know, approved has a success rate of about 10.5%. The success rate of the um, portfolio chosen by the population of MBA students, about 10.5%. Not statistically different from random chance. This is monkeys picking marbles out of urns, right? That's, as, that's about as good as they get. So then we expose them to disruption theory. Second sucker punch question of the evening. How do you think they did? This is how much better they got at picking the losers. So no improvement at all. Right? That's statistically insignificant, absolutely meaningless. They were no better at spotting the failures. This is how much better they got at picking the winners. Now, what I can tell you is there's at least one person in the room who thinks that's a pretty significant result. Right? The portfolio of investments that the students picked as a population post-treatment, right, after learning about disruption theory, was, about, was as much as 50% better. A success rate going from 10% to about 15% for certain of the treatments. And in every instance, they got statistically significantly better. Right? So what that means is that if I told you for the price of a one hour lecture, I can improve your ability to pick winners by 50%, I mean, how much would you pay for that lecture? No, no, I'm not, I'm not kidding. How much would you pay for that lecture? <laughs> I'm doing some market research here. My hope is that what this does is it, in subjecting disruption theory to an empirical test of its ability to improve your predictive accuracy, it does two things. First of all, I think that's never been done before. I'm happy to be wrong about that, hard to read everything, but as nearly as I can tell, this hasn't been tried before. The other thing it does is that it demonstrates that disruption theory is teachable to a large population of people who can then apply it and observe a material improvement in their performance. Because this is very often a criticism of any theory, right? It's all well and good for the, for the, the, the discoverer and the promulgator of a given theory to say, well, I'm really good at applying my theory in ways that can make you better, but it turns out I'm the only one who can do it. How about that? 
This actually demonstrates that we can teach it to hundreds of people in a relatively short period of time, and they realize an observable <coughs> benefit from having been so instructed. Right. One of the challenges with any theory, especially when you're forced to use words that are in common currency, when you talk about disruption theory, that word comes to mean everything and nothing if you're not careful. Right. And what we've shown here is that we can actually give those terms enough theoretical bite that people can do something meaningful with the results. My take on it is that by making innovation more predictable, we can begin to move, as I said at the outset, from this idiosyncratic phase of decision making to something that is much more probabilistic and it has material impact on the processes we use to manage innovation. Most of what we do today is modeled explicitly um, on a theory of evolution by natural selection, right? It's a variation selection retention model that I was outlining at the beginning. That is exactly the right thing to do when decision making is fun fundamentally idiosyncratic and we have no idea what success looks like. But if we can in fact follow the odds, move to a more probabilistic based decision making when it comes to uh, innovation, we can actually manage it differently because we can exploit that increased level of knowledge and insight. We can move from variation, which is about just getting as many ideas from as many different places as we can, to something that is much more focused. We can identify those areas that systematically we know provide more uh, promising seedbeds for disruptive innovations. Rather than selection pressures, market-based selection pressures, which in my view, as I said, are essentially designed to minimize the cost of failure, we can instead shape our ideas so that we can, come, we can more nearly maximize the likelihood of success. I think that's a dramatic shift in how we think about innovation and managing it uh, purposefully rather than simply increasing the level of randomness and hoping that the law of large numbers leads to a hit eventually. And finally, when it comes to retention, which is subject to all kinds of issues around false negatives around and false positives in the early stages of introducing a product to market, we can actually stick to our guns. We can stick with those ideas that we know have a systematically higher likelihood of success over time, rather than hoping that whatever early signals we get from the marketplace happen to be accurate. So my hope is that I've at least whetted your appetite, piqued your curiosity around the possibility that innovation is not this hand-waving, uh, this, this preserve of the hand-waving wild-eyed locust eaters who seem magically to come up with great ideas, nor is it the preserve of sort of, 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 of a necessarily highly random process that we hope to just sort of hang on to the bull and hope we can ride it. Rather, disruption theory gives me hope at least that innovation can become much more nearly a systematic process so that we can now achieve deliberately what in the past we've only been able to hope for. So thanks so much for your time this evening. I look forward to the conversation. <laughs>